the heart of art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome back to the Camry Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Our guest for today will be Sam Woodfin. He is an oil painter that was born and raised here in Bryan, Texas, so right here from the Bra Brazos Valley. Uh, we talk a good amount about his use of color in his paintings and what they represent. Uh, we also talk about how he became a lecturer here at Texas A&M University. And uh, we uncover the mysteries that hide behind his works. Um, we see where those ideas for his works came from. So we have a great conversation and I know you guys are going to love it. To start off, I'd like to go over some art announcements. And um, the first one is from Forsyth Galleries. Um, they have an exhibit on right now called Here, Faces and Voices of Native Aggies. And this exhibit celebrates Native American students and the influence that they've had on Texas A&M. And uh, this includes uh, everything from interviews, artifacts, and photographs. And they all show you know, these changes that um, Native Aggies have made from athletics at A&M to the core and to the arts. So uh, this is a great exhibit and I encourage you all to visit it. It does end on July 14th, so it is coming up at the Memorial Student Center, room 2428. And if you want to learn more about this uh, exhibit, you can go to uart.tamu.edu. All right, and for a second art announcement, we have the MSC Visual Arts Community, uh, MSC VAC. Uh, they are currently having an exhibit, and it's titled The Bryan College Station Community Showcase. And this is a work, uh, works of 30 local artists. So a lot of local artists in, from all kinds of mediums. The whole exhibit itself uh, creates like a beautiful puzzle of our community. Uh, and some pieces are for sale. So if you are looking to, you know, maybe hang up some art in your home, uh, this uh, exhibition will be available until August 13th. So you have a lot of time to go check it out, but make sure you do. Uh, it opened yesterday, uh, July 5th, and it will be open until August 13th. And this is at the Reynolds Gallery on the second floor of the MSC. And if you'd like more information about this, you can go to vac.tamu.edu. All right, let's start off the show and make sure to tune in next week. Today in the KMU Studios, we have a very special guest. His name is Sam Woodfin. He is an oil painter and is a lecturer here at Texas A&M under the Department of Visualization. And he also won BuzzFeed's 100 Figurative Oil Painters working right now. So congratulations for that, Sam. And yeah. how are you today? Thank you very much. I'm doing great. How are you doing? Doing great. I'm excited for our conversation today. Me too. All right. And um, if you want to go and check out uh, Sam's work through his website while we have this conversation, um, the website is samwoodfin.art. That's samwoodfin, W-O-O-D-F-I-N dot A-R-T. All right. Uh, well, to start off, I like to go through the background of my guests. Um, so I wanted to ask you, where do you call home and where did this love for art begin? Great. Yeah. So I grew up in Bryan. Uh, so I'm actually a, a local townie. Awesome. Um, I went to Bryan High, class of 2006, and uh, both my parents were professors at the university here. And um, my mom's an artist. My dad's a landscape architect. And so I, I grew up around design and creative thinking, and uh, it always just seemed like a natural thing to do. I always had a sketchbook with me, and uh, it was what I spent my time doing when I had to wait for other people. Right. So your parents really helped you develop this love then? I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were really, really supportive. Awesome. And have you always had that love for color? Because I feel like the first thing that I look at when I when I go into your website is the use of color. There's just so much, so many vibrant like uh, blues, reds, and greens and purple. Um, so yeah, where did that love for color start? I was lucky enough to be able to go to art school for my undergrad. I went to Art Center College of Design in Los Angeles, awesome. in uh, Pasadena, California, and got uh, a Bachelor of Fine Art in Illustration Design. Awesome. Um, and when I was making work there, I was working on painting, but mostly I was drawing and using pen and ink. So most of my work, I think, was monochromatic or black and white or had really simple color. And I was intimidated by color. I didn't really 
have a uh, an intuitive understanding of how it related to itself. Um, so it was through years of practice later on, um, taking a couple of painting workshops after after school, and then also uh, going back to school, going to graduate school, and and learning more. I think I got um, enough information for me to to be able to just take take it and run. Right. Um, I still think that the color I use is pretty simple, even though they are very bright colors. Mm -hmm. They, uh, I'm not trying to combine a whole bunch of different hues and make really complicated images. I really want the images to be very direct. Right. So the color choices are kind of simple in that, like, you know, if you go on my website, the first image is like a red figure on a blue background. Right. So there's kind of a simple one, two statement there. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, there are a lot of colors, but it's it's fairly fairly simple. Yeah. Um, so it was it was later. It was through painting a lot that I that I really grasped onto color and have started to use it. I've always wanted my painting and my drawing to get closer together, hmm. and that's been the the frustrating part of my journey hasn't been that oh it's been a lot of work. It's a lot of work, no matter who you are. It's that um, I later figured out that painting and drawing are the same thing hmm. and that the, the distinction between them is fairly meaningless when you're actually making work. So, yeah, I know that's, it, it's, in terms of color, I also, I took a, a color workshop from a really amazing artist out of, who lives in Florida, a guy named Douglas Flint, who um, I think really taught me how to mix paint. I mean, the reason why I mention color is because uh, the color that you do use is something that's not really found in nature very much. Mm -hmm. So it is a very like starking difference to the colors that we do find in our everyday lives. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think I want my paintings to be a different place. I don't mm -hmm. want them to feel like they are uh, a moment of normality captured. Um, they're more of a psychological, dreamlike space where the rules can be bent without things failing to make sense mm -hmm. or the image, you know, I want my images to be legible and in that sense, easy to, uh, easy to understand, maybe not easy to interpret in a lot of, in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. but you can look at the image and identify what is happening. Like, oh, there's a person on a horse and in a crowd of people why i'm not necessarily making a uh a declarative statement about why i'm putting the shapes next to each other and letting the tension between them be the why right mm -hmm. and it's up to the viewer's interpretation really yeah mm -hmm. i i think that for me personally i get a lot of satisfaction out of work that does that uh, and in a way it's um it requires the viewer to take a more active role in the art Mm -hmm. um, not that they, you know, have to do any actions or anything, but um, it's more of a philosophical conundrum that requires a little bit of working through mm -hmm. to make declarative statements about the meaning of the work. So in that sense, I, I like that ambiguity. I think that's the the advantage of making a statement with an image rather than a rather than a sentence. Mm -hmm. You know, a sentence. Even though words are abstract, images can be much more ambiguous, I think, in, in, in some cases. Yeah. You know, that's awesome that you gave that introduction because we are going to go into specific works of yours. So that's a great introduction for that. Oh, um, I did want to ask, uh, how did you end up lecturing here at Texas A&M? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting story hmm. and kind of a long one, but I'll, I'll give you the short version. Yes, please. So when I was at Art Center <clears throat> and... Uh, working for the school as a, well, at, at, at Art Center, um, the teaching assistant positions are coveted. Mm -hmm. They're, they're um, you have to work for them and work up to them and in some cases take classes more than once um, or sit in on classes. So um, I had a really influential instructor, a guy named Norm Sherman, uh, tragically, uh, he, he was tragically killed in the middle of the semester when I was oh. taking his course. Oh, no. And 
what I he taught this advanced drawing course called dynamic sketching, also known as visual communication four. So it was kind of a sophomore junior level class, and it was a really uh, amazing drawing course um, because Norm was a product designer. He wasn't really an illustrator, okay. but his his methods uh, worked really, really well for all kinds of artistic approaches. Hmm. So after he died, uh, I went around to all of my classmates who had taken his courses already um, and got all of the course notes and pictures of his drawings because he used to fill an entire classroom with drawings. So it would be, uh, you know, a 25 foot wall with chalkboards on three sides and he, or dry erase boards. And he would come in an hour before class and just fill, fill them up completely, wow. you know, with 75 drawings. <laughs> um, and they would be illustrating the, that day's concept. Mm -hmm. Um, and what was really amazing about that course is every other class, we'd, we'd meet in class and then we'd meet on location. So one of the places we met was the uh, Los Angeles Tank Museum, Whoa. which is in El Monte, California. And it's just, uh, it's a lot like the American, uh, the Muse Museum of the American GI here, but not as nice. Oh. Uh, the Museum of the American GI, if you haven't been there, I highly recommend that you go check it out. It's an amazing resource uh, for history buffs and for artists. Mm -hmm. um, so there was lots of just tanks, and we would just go on location and draw all day. Wow. So that was a really formative experience for me. And um, when I handed off the notes and photographs to uh, Will Weston, who took over for him, I got to TA for the course. And so I did that for about a year. And that was my first teaching experience. Hmm. Um, from there, I actually moved back to Texas and... Um, it was kind of a, a series of serendipitous events that led to me being offered one evening course in visualization, teaching figure drawing, which is a, which is basically like drawing two. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I was offered a full time job, and uh, worked from for about three years, and then I actually uh, had to had to quit and go to graduate school. And I was lucky enough to be rehired when I finished school. So I've been back here for four years now. Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I love working here. I'm I'm so grateful. Great. Um, I wanted to ask, why did you prefer oil painting as a medium and not any other form? That's an interesting question. Um, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with oil paint. Oil mm -hmm. paint is uh, requires a lot. If you break out the oil paint, you've committed to a lot of cleanup. Mm -hmm. already so there's uh there's there's a the chemistry of it requires some discipline and having some methods that keep everything tidy and organized uh it's it's kind of a form of of alchemy or primitive chem chemistry in that you're hand mixing chemicals together um and i love the physicality of that but I also love using acrylic. I love using gouache. I love using paint. I paint with ink sometimes. So I'll use water-based and oil-based mediums, just kind of depending on how much cleanup I want to do, I think. Okay. <laughs> the oil paint, I think, at the end of the day, has a much higher um, color intensity. Hmm. Yeah, and that, those are, that's good for your, your pieces of work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, I, I also see a big concentration on human anatomy and human faces apart from your you know industrial like machinery type mm -hmm. of stuff um i wanted to ask if there was like a specific message on like human nature that you like to portray i think so for me i always come back to human anatomy because i'm totally fascinated by the relationship of the body to the idea of consciousness or the experience mm -hmm. of consciousness okay. uh, depending on who you talk to um so I think the, 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 the tension between the physicality of the actual makeup of someone's body plus the complexity of their emotional life and thought make for, for images that are, you know, in some sense, I think, paradoxical and uh, at odds with themselves, and just like people. Hmm. Yeah. Um, um, I, I also just am interested in structure. So 
in, in that like the body is a vessel for consciousness, the structure of that I think has a really big impact on how we experience our own existence. And the work is about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Of our experience. Um, yeah, because these are, you know, I don't know if you would describe them as such, but very somber images, if, if I can say so myself. And yeah, it really fair. forces the audience to pay attention. Um, I also saw on your Instagram that, you know, on your bio, you say you're a feminist in Texas. Oh, yeah. So I did want to ask, like, why do you think it's important for men in art, you know, to be feminists? Oh, oh how much time do we have? <laughs> it's um, a big question. <laughs> um, for me, I think it's just obvious that everybody benefits from everybody being treated the same mm -hmm. um, which is the, really what feminism is is just everybody gets treated the same mm -hmm. um, I think the way things are now you know uh, there's kind of preferential treatment in our culture mm -hmm. uh, towards men which is I think uh, you know fundamentally against what our country says it's about mm -hmm. um, and so it's important for me to to just treat people as people and and I really try not to uh, I try not to bring in the, like the inflection of gender as much as possible in my interactions with students especially this newer generation of students I think it's especially important for them yeah mm -hmm. but um, it just is uh, it just seems obvious to me mm -hmm. yeah I mean I, I mentioned it because you have a lot of works that I Apart from like the human anatomy, it's like women anatomy. Mm -hmm. Of course, I wanted to speak about uh, leaving the island, um, ah, yeah. which holds uh, a female figure at the forefront with a red blanket surrounding her uh, with blue clouds behind. And um, I mean, this kind of gave me the idea like that she was being displaced from a home. Um, but yeah, what was your mind when you when you started on this? This is a this is an interesting one because there's this this is a painting that's about a specific person. Okay. This is a, a really close friend of, friend of mine from graduate school named Aixa Oliveras, who's also a painter, an artist, awesome. um, and a really skilled one. She went to the, uh, I think, the Instituto de Plasticos in Puerto Rico, I oh, believe wow. is what it's called. I think I'm wrong about that. But um, she uh, had been in a sort of boring job for a decade and decided to walk away from Puerto Rico and come to the States and go, go back to school wow. just as a, as a personal quest to uh, improve herself and her, her work, her work life. So uh, she came to the States right before Hurricane Maria hit. As, I, as she and I became better and better friends, you know, I learned more and more about her situation back there and how bittersweet it was for her to, to leave the island right before the hurricane hit mm -hmm. and then know that her family is back there and they're having a hard time and she can't go back and help them really right and know? that guilt <laughs> there's definitely a lot of guilt about mm -hmm. that melancholy and and uh and i hope in the painting like hope as well uh -huh. yeah um so um, the the blanket is um in some sense i think like her her own personal strength which okay. is partially part of her culture yeah. and partially just who she is and then you know the background is all the things that happen when you're a living person mm. thank you for that sure um i was wondering about your balance between your art your work your social life <laughs> like how, how do you manage all those oh, that's a good question i would say with the the last couple of years in the pandemic um it has been much more difficult to balance those. Mm -hmm. um, I love my job, but it does use a lot of my creative, uh, creative energy and, and thinking. And so uh, it's challenging to keep, to hold a little bit of, ba of that back for, your, for myself and also feel like I'm doing a good job teaching. And so that's something that I, I feel like I'm constantly struggle, I'm struggling with, but, uh, in reality, I've, I'm doing a good job uh, at work, and uh, probably my personal work doesn't get quite as much attention hmm. as I'd like it to. Right. Uh, one of the things I love about my job is that I get the summers off. So I get to uh, work on my own personal work and do a little bit of stuff for the school. But mostly my time during the summer is for me, and I, I need that time to recharge because uh, 
teaching teaching people and working one on one. I only teach studio courses, and I teach a lot of them. Um, teaching one on one is is an emotionally draining but very rewarding thing to spend time doing. It does kind of leave you with less for yourself. I think if you're if you're if you're giving too much away. Right. So you're free right now. You're you're having the time of I your am. life. <laughs> I am. Awesome. I uh. I've got projects that I've got going on for the summer, so I like to keep long-term projects going. Right. Um, right now, I've got one that's in collaboration with uh, a really amazing um, uh, guy from uh, Atmospheric Science, Rodrigo Bombardi, who just went back into the private sector, but he's been um, at the school, and we're working. We've got a grant where um, we are writing. Uh, we have written a comic about the history of weather science, and we've got a team of four students that are illustrating it. So that'll be a um, about a 30-page graphic novel that, that'll probably come out next year. Wow. So that's a um, really fun project that's uh, in the works right now. Mm-hmm. Really excited about the results that we're getting, and um, I also work with the uh, launch program. Okay. Uh, with under in the uh, with undergraduate research. Yeah. And I, uh, I have four students that I usually work with really closely over the course of the year, and they work on a, a personal creative project um, and write, a, write a, a research paper, an undergraduate thesis about that. And that's been a really interesting uh, program to be involved with. I've learned a lot. I know the students learn a lot. Um, a lo- the university makes a lot of resources available mm-hmm. to them. So that's also been a really rewarding thing. The students make all kinds of stuff. They make comic books. They've made animations, hand-drawn animations, wow. 3D animations, um, paintings. Um, I know that a couple of them have taken what they've made and, and translated it into the job market very easily, too, mm-hmm. which is always reassuring. Yeah, that's awesome that they're getting that exper- that writing experience right off the bat before yeah. they get it's, to go into graduate school. I know. It's Sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get the students to write, but it's good for them. Yeah, it, it's tough. It's tough, for yeah. sure. Um, I did see on your Instagram that you do highlight um, a lot of films or, like, shows. I wonder if this was, like, a, a sort of inspiration for you from, like, film media? Definitely. I So growing up here in Bryan in the 90s, um, this is a great town to grow up in. I love Bryan. But there weren't a lot of artistic resources here, yeah. you know. Now, it was still a, you know, uh, an interruption in the pasture landscape. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really, I think I got a lot from movies and books as a kid, just because that was what I had, mm-hmm. you know, what was around. Yeah. And I grew up. This is crazy. Before the internet. What? Whoa. <laughs> I know. Crazy. Um, so books for me and movies are were an important source of of ideas and imagery, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, novels as well i love fantasy and sci-fi i always have books going and um so looking at at the world and what other people are making creatively i think is a way for me to to kind of to sort of keep an eye on like where the bar of quality is Mm -hmm. because i I aspire to a really high quality of work Mm -hmm. you know as high as the the work that i used to look at when i was a little kid there's lots of artists that i really admired growing up Jeffrey Catherine Jones, uh, Michael Kaluta, Barry Windsor Smith, Bernie Wrightson, um, George Pratt, uh, and uh, classic painters, John Singer, Singer Sargent, uh, Remedio Svaro, um, Frida Kahlo, I love her work. Um, and so f- for me, like TV shows, books, documentaries, those are, those are ways into these paradigms that I want to know more about. And, and other people's lives. I also am a, mu- am a musician myself, awesome. so it's I, I'm interested in how creative people both like leverage their skills into let's call it a lifestyle or into a career, mm-hmm. um, because there's so many different ways to do that. That's one of the hard things about being an artist and training artists is that there's not necessarily a well beaten path to success the way. Uh, you might find if you studied engineering or computer science Mm -hmm. where there's, oh, you know, here's a job. Uh, It's more like you have to identify a creative niche and then occupy it. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you have to convince and show people that it has value. And that, that's how you make that, 
make that creative independence possible. Awesome. What would you say your niche is? Oh, that's a good question. Um, my niche is somewhere between fine art oil painting and comic book illustration. Okay. Um, if I were to compare myself artistically to an artist, there's an artist named Aaron Weisenfeld uh, on the West Coast who started out as a comic artist and now has trans transitioned into just selling fine art in, the, in galleries. All right. um, so in my own head, I like to think that I'm more like that, but um, I've been in academia for the last eight years, so really that's where I make my living. Mm -hmm. um, and I make my own creative works either in comics or in uh, design and illustration, imagery. So I, I would say if I were to go back into the illustration industry right now, I'd probably look for uh, pre-production art or uh, maybe book cover illustration, something along those lines. Wow, awesome. Well, I hope you get to do it someday. <laughs> yeah, for sure. yeah. Well, I always, I have these these wonderful opportunities that always show up on the side and it's, you know, it's a, it's always a balancing act. Like, do I have the time to take on more of this and, right. you know, mm -hmm. and fulfill my other commitments? And uh, it's always a challenge, but it's fun to try and meet, meet the amount of work that it takes to, to be good at this. Mm -hmm, yeah. You got to learn to say no sometimes. <laughs> oh yeah, that's my favorite word. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you have any future dates of like exhibitions coming up that you would like to tell our audience about? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, as of right now, I don't have anything uh, in the works. But um, if you keep an eye on my Instagram at Sam Woodfin or on my website uh, samwoodfin.art, um, there'll be updates there. All right. Yeah. Well, make sure to go check it out. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about your art that you we might not have covered yet? Oh, plenty. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I'll say this. I think the, for me, the art is less the, um, for me, the satisfaction doesn't come from the finished product. I think it comes from the process. And I think mm -hmm. that's an important thing to keep in mind for, for every artist is that if you, if you have trouble with the process, you know, um, maybe you're not including enough outside information. So, uh, the art for me is a way for exploring my relationship with the world, learning new things. Um, I constantly am teaching myself new skills and uh, learning about new subjects. The last couple of years have been really, I've been really interested in uh, geology. Right. I, I take trips out to the, the Southwest desert every summer usually and uh, awesome. looking at all the land formations out there have get, have, really made me curious about that and that's starting to show up in my art too so it all feeds into into itself so it's I think it's really important to look at other subjects look at things you're unfamiliar with and try and try and understand and try and bring some of that into the work I think if you really are trying to understand it'll show up in the work whether mm -hmm. you, whether you're meaning for it to or not Definitely. if you're being honest about your own subject matter awesome well, I think that's some great advice for new artists everywhere. <laughs> uh, well, Sam, thank you so much for stopping by. I, I learned so much. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Uh, happy happy to share and really excited to be here. I'm so happy that this show's here. I heard a, an ad for it a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, finally, <laughs> yes. finally the heart of art is here. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.